Adora Crystal. Well, welcome to the Rich Queen Podcast. I believe that we each came here to experience, create, express something so so freaking epic. And I believe that your life and all that you create is your queendom. Your journey to rich living, rich living, whatever that is for you, for you, starts now. I think you remember me saying you read the dictionary so many times through. Every... When I was uh, 18 years old, I ended up having a challenge in school. Okay. And I had failed my first test in oh. college after taking a GED. And I had learning problems. And to overcome that, I, with the help of my mom, I went to a dictionary and I started memorizing the beginning of the dictionary to the end of the dictionary in 30 words a day. Oh my God. And my mom would test me on my ability to spell, pronounce, and use them meaningfully in a sentence. And my vocabulary was able to grow because of that. And then I started reading encyclopedias. So I got to read eight complete sets of encyclopedias to try to help me catch up with the rest of the students. Oh, wow. That's so incredible. As someone, I, I went to 13 schools before ninth grade and the feeling of belonging and understanding how to As someone who is quite nomadic, a lot of my adult life as well, I love your story. And I know that a lot of people who will watch the replay or will be with us live, they love to travel or they're unique people that are out fighting for their own missions, you know, living their own causes, living kind of offbeat. But many people have the feeling of not... um, belonging in the world. So will you just share the little story about the world as your home all the way up to the actual world? <laughs> well, I, uh, when I was a very young boy, I had the desire to travel. And by the time I was nine, I used to ride my bicycle sometimes 35 miles in different directions just to go and explore. When I was 12, I was hopping trains from city to city. Wow. When I was 13, I was hitchhiking to various cities. What? And when I was 14, I hitchhiked from Houston, Texas to Los Angeles and up and down the coast and down into Mexico, down to Puerto Vallarta and Acapulco. So I've been a traveler. When I was 15, I ended up moving to Hawaii. And I lived there kind of as... On your own? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Left when I was 13. Oh, my gosh. So I've been a traveler most of my life. And today, I've been saying since I was probably 20 that the universe is my playground, the world is my home, Every country is a room of the house, and every city is a platform that I get to share my heart and soul. And so that's been sort of an affirmation that's been running in my head. Hi, Melissa. And today I've been blessed to uh, travel. I've traveled 19 million miles on flights. Wow. And I've um, been to 145 countries. And I live on a ship called the world, which circumnavigates the world constantly. And I'm off and on as I travel and speak. And so I'm sort of a global kind of thinker. And and global liver, so I, I I feel at home really anywhere in every country. So people say, where do you live? And I say, I look at where I was the most that year and I call that the home. Oh, I love that. I love the change of perspective. And that, that ship called The World, it's been on the Travel Channel or something, hasn't it? Yeah, they've done many documentaries on it and uh, shows or pieces on it. Melissa says, oh my God, I love him. She loves you, see the heart faces. Yeah, um, and she says, he wrote my favorite quote, when the voice inside is louder than the voices outside, you have mastered your life, or something like that. Yes, that was from The Secret of Things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that um, if you don't fill your day with high-priority actions that are deeply meaningful and that inspire you from within, your day will fill up with low-priority distractions from without. And if you don't pursue challenges that inspire you, you will attract challenges that don't. So it's up to us, because nobody has an outside person dedicated to the fulfillment of your life. We have the, might say the responsibility or accountability to decide, you know, fairly and reasonably based on what we value on us, what it is we want to fill our day with and how we want to make our lives. We're the captains of our ship, masters of our fate, and we have, our, our hierarchy of values determines our destiny. So give yourself permission to do something extraordinary based on what's most meaningful to you and uh, watch what happens to your life. So it's basically what you're saying right there is that we're all going to have challenges, 
but that if you don't choose challenges that inspire you, that your world will fill up with challenges that take over your life and suck your energy, right? It's the same way with economics. If you don't take a portion of whatever you earn and then apply it, invest it in assets that appreciate in value, which is a reflection of your own appreciation of yourself, you have unexpected bills and tropically destroy your potential to gain uh, mastery over finances. So if you don't fill your, your coffers, you may say, with things that are meaningful to you, assets, put money in your pocket passively, uh, you will always have to work for money as a slave instead of its master. Yeah, I loved what you were saying last night about that you spent a certain number of years earning money really well and you prioritized beautiful things and you always had the things that you wanted at the end of the year. But it wasn't until you started valuing actual wealth building and buying assets that, um, that you started creating wealth and therefore your freedom. Well, I... I uh... I realize that money circulates through the economy from those who value it least to those who value it most. And those that have the least order and organization around wealth building are compared to those that have great order and organization. So if you really value something, like an individual, I said last night that people will circulate through the society from those who value them least to those who value them most. And so just like people, money goes and flows where it's appreciated. And if you invest wisely, um, you don't have to spend your life struggling with money. You can have it work for you. And you can work because you love to, not because you have to. I love that. And I think that is so powerful thinking about people, the people in our lives. If we don't, we've got to appreciate them, celebrate them, or they'll end up going to the places where they are appreciated and celebrated. This is how the affairs of the secretary or, or things like this happen, right? Uh, anything you're not willing to do with your mate, you'll probably end up having to delegate. <laughs> oh my gosh, ouch, I love that. <laughs> I love that, I love that. And also, if you're, being, if you're somewhere where you're just being tolerated and not appreciated, you'll start to naturally feel drawn to places where you're celebrating. And if you're not, hey, go find them, please. Well, you, you want to prioritize. It's wise to prioritize. And it's wise to prioritize what you're doing on a daily basis. Because if you're doing high priority actions, you grow in self-worth. If you do low priority distractions uh, and things that other people expect, but not necessarily things that are deeply meaningful, you'll lower your self-worth. The same thing with the people. If you don't prioritize the people you associate with, you probably won't grow and build momentum and expand your sphere of awareness and influence as effectively. And if you don't prioritize uh, everything that you read and learn, and in any area of your life, you can be used as a prioritization process. And it's up to you, it's not somebody else's priorities, it's yours. Because if nobody's gonna get up and dedicate your life to it, what's the priority to you? If they're gonna project their values onto you and show love according to their values onto you. And if you don't show love in your own values, you'll be, in a sense, subordinating to the world on the outside and living in the shadows of people instead of standing on the shoulders of giants. Whoa, I love it. I thought of that phrase this morning, standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, Amy, I do have other questions for you, but Amy wanted me to ask you what your, who your favorite authors are aside from yourself. She said, of course, you're a great author, but, but who are some of your favorite authors? You know, I, I've been blessed to devour a lot of books. And um, I've read over 3,220-something books now. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm constantly reading. But I can say that there's a very great book that I think every human being can benefit by. And it's a, a book composed by Mortimer Adler. And it's called Syntopican Volumes 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. And it is the greatest ideas by the greatest thinkers over the last 2,700 years dealing with the greatest most important topics. That's why it's called syntopicon. Mm -hmm. It's a synthesis of the topics of the greatest ideas from the greatest minds over the last 2,700 years, starting from the Greek philosopher and pre-Socratic philosopher Thales all the way to today, all the way into the 19th and 20th century. And um, I really believe that that is a great tome. It's two big volumes, it's about 800 pages each, but it's, it is filled with wisdom. There's nothing in there that's not worthy of devouring. And I think that I, I tell most of my students to 
certainly start with those two books are a good piece. Of course, there's great books like Ralph Waldo Emerson's Selected Bodies by him, and there's great uh, teachings. But I'm more interested in reading something that has stood the test of time yeah. than um, immediate fads or temporary whims that come along. So I'm constantly feeding my mind with the greatest ideas by the greatest minds through time that I can get my hold of. I love it. I love it. So I love. Do you mind telling that story in the prison and about how nothing is missing? I think a lot of us suffer with mama drama, papa drama, baby drama, lost my job drama, and uh, you have such a great process and a great story. I'd love for you to share that. Well, the story um, emerges from being in South Africa. I was asked to speak at the Kruger's Door Prison there, which is a massive prison. And um, the, it was, I spoke first to the, uh, all the people that worked at the prison, about 400 people, and the warden. And then I went three stories underground, literally down under the bowels of the earth, as they say. Um, and I was in a holding room, and we had Al Jazeera television crew with us, and my publicist, and my director. And we went into this holding room, and then finally we went into the main room where there's 1,000 orange-uniformed maximum security prisoners. They were there for 25 years to life. They're probably the toughest of the toughest. Wow. And I walked in, and they led me, six guards led me into the center of the room. And I don't, because I was not as tall as some of the people in the room, I got to stand on a little rubber, one foot and a half high kind of stool. Oh, wow. And so I'm literally having to kind of pivot on this stool and have six bodyguards around me and the warden standing there. And um, the first thing I did is I asked the, the inmates, I said, if um, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you're experiencing or what you are experiencing, um, how many of you would love to do something amazing and make a great, great difference in the world? And instantaneously, everyone in the room put their hand up. In prison, you in asked prison. them, how would you love to do something great in the world? Yeah. No matter where, you, oh wow. And it was yeah. really, and it, every, everybody in there question. had an innate yearning to want to go and do something magnificent. They may have had challenges in their perceptions or actions along the way, but deep inside, the core, the essence of their soul were called to do something that made a difference. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to watch this unanimous response. And then we started to, I started to dialogue and interact. And finally, this one gentleman who was a little bit uh, cocky uh, challenged me. He said, well, that's easy for you to say, you know, you don't have what I had and you had an easy life and this and that, even though I lived on the streets too. He didn't know that, did he? And, I, and, I, and he said, he said, I didn't have no mama, I didn't have no papa, I didn't have no this, I didn't. And he was running his racket, his story. And he wanted to be victim of history instead of master of destiny. And I just came off the stool spontaneously, not thinking of the rules that I'm supposed to follow by walking with the guard. Yeah, because you're not supposed to be walking around yeah. with these huge men that are all taller than you. Yeah, I just, I just walked, walked in towards this man, and um, I didn't have any thought about what might happen. I just wanted to help the guy. And I, was, I walked up to him and I said, listen, at the level of the essence of your soul, there's nothing missing. At the level of the existence of your senses, things appear to be missing. And you may appear to have a lost father or lost mother, but other people emerge in one or many forms, in male or female forms, somebody else plays that role. And wisdom is looking deeper and broader and discovering the form that it's in mm -hmm. and not thinking that you're a victim of this history, but you're actually a master of transforming your perceptions and decisions and seeing things and actions. And as I was communicating with him and saying that nothing was missing, you could see him trying with his eyes to see who it was in his life, gang leaders, best friends, fathers, these kind of things. And then all of a sudden, way off in the distance, maybe about 90 feet away, a gentleman who was in his 60s started crying. Mm -hmm. He just started bawling. And um, when I turned, everybody looked at him, and he was a very highly respected inmate. He'd been there for 26 years, was there for life, and because he was bawling, everybody just called and just like, here's one of the great inmates crying. Wow. And so I just spontaneously started to go towards him. Wow. And the guards, we all walked towards this uh, gentleman. And as I did, the warden came beside me and um, he says, I know who my mama is. I know who my mama is. 
It says, and he turned and he pointed to the warden, who was a woman. Mm -hmm. He says, yo mamama, you've been mamama for 26 years. If it wasn't for you, I would have died. I would have been dead. I would have overdosed. I would have been shot. Mm -hmm. You saved my life, mama. Yo my mama. I just realized you've been my mama all these years. And the whole place, 1,000 men were in tears. And even the warden was in tears. And the guards forgot that they were guards. They were processing their own lives. Mm. Everybody in that, in that uh, prison had a really heart-opening, authentic moment. Mm. And, um, and he realized it wasn't missing, and he was not a victim. He realized he had awakened himself to see that there was fullness mm. in, the, in the perception of it. Yeah, I think that's so huge because, um, you know, I went through your breakthrough experience many years ago. That was pre-inviting me to be on The Secret. And um, I found that to be such, I didn't know that story then, but I found that process of realizing that nothing is missing, that everything is in balance, uh, such a powerful, powerful process. She says, wow, amazing story. Susan says she's in California. Um, so, do you want to add anything to that about someone reflecting, anyone reflecting in their life uh, before we move on? Well, just to, that I've been blessed. I've been teaching for 46 years, and I, um, I've been blessed to do a program that you just mentioned, the Breakthrough Experience, for 30 years. And uh, I've watched tens of thousands of people um, who have the perception that they have made a mistake. And I say to them, I said, the only time you think you've made a mistake is when you've compared your daily actions to other people's values. And the only time you think other people have made a mistake is when you compare their actions to your values. And whenever we inject the values of others or project the values of ours onto others, we live in the illusion of mistakes. Mm -hmm. We don't discover the hidden order in the apparent chaos that we create. And so wisdom is realizing that when in our own decisions, our own values play a role. Mm -hmm. And that the hierarchy of our values is dictating our destiny because it's affecting our perceptions, decisions, and actions. And that every decision you make is based on what we believe at that moment, the day that we have, it's going to give us the greatest advantage or disadvantage over the, all options. And people are doing the, the, the greatest thing they can with the values, and they're living efficiently. In the Breakthrough Experience, I help people ask a new set of questions and discover the hidden order in their lives. And then they shed the illusions that there were mistakes in it. And then their self-worth, you know, rises. And they give themselves permission to do something extraordinary because they don't have the fear of recreating an illusion that they've been carrying. Mm, that's that, so and, powerful. And not carrying, not, not projecting onto others or injecting from others, but actually giving yourself permission to communicate what is meaningful to you in terms of what's meaningful to others. This is the master of life. This opens the door to relationships and social leadership and business leadership, sales. I mean, every aspect of life is impacted because people want to be loved for who they are, not for who they are supposed to be or what they, and you think they're supposed to be. And you want to be loved for who you are, not what everybody thinks you're supposed to be. And most and people aren't loving themselves for who they are. Because they keep, they keep subordinating. See, we have a dysmorphia. We have this perception that we're... We, we're, we're too humble to admit what we see in other great people is inside us. But we can't see greatness in others unless we have it inside us. Once we look deeper and see the form in which we're expressing what we honor in them, uh, once we do, we give permission to stand in the same position, mm -hmm. not in their shadows, but on their shoulders. And then we realize the same thing for the people that we've negated. We may be resenting them, but it's because we're too proud to admit what we see in them is inside us. But once we own it, on both sides of ourselves, the hero and the villain, the saint and the sinner. We don't need to get rid of any part of ourselves to love ourselves, and we give ourselves permission to be whole. And I think that's what we all want innately, but we don't give ourselves permission because we've indoctrinated ourselves by social customs and mothers and fathers and preachers and teachers and traditions and things that may not be so, but have been passed down as if they're so. Mm -hmm. And the best way, and the most powerful way to disempower a society is to promote an idealism that nobody can live by. Yeah. And this is very common. And so we have to go past the parody and, and actually think and be integral with our own awareness about what's going on in our life and be accountable for seeing the balance of life. 
If we do, we have balanced physiology, balanced psychology, and we have accountability, and we can balance our checkbook, if you will. <laughs> That's so incredible. What, now I think we're on it, so what is spirit to you? Or, yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, whatever inspires an individual, see, when we have, if we're factory with somebody, we look up to them. If we resent somebody, we look down on them. If we look up to them, we minimize ourselves. If we look down on them, we exaggerate ourselves. So anytime we judge somebody above or below on pedestals or pits, we're not being ourselves. And when we do, the judgment makes our mind close off our heart. But the second we have reflective awareness and we have equanimity within us and equity between ourselves and others, the heart opens and we access the true nature, the authentic self. And we get inspired and tears of gratitude come out of our eyes for seeing the awe, the, the magnificent hidden order in our daily experience. In that moment, we have this spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. It transcends the imminent mind, as Immanuel Kant would say, the judges, it's caught in the analytical, the breaking down of things. And so that some, the moment we transcend them, we see things as they are, not as we thought they were, uh, we get inspired. And Everybody has a different view of what that is because they have a unique set of values. Some people's spiritual path will be raising a beautiful family. Some will be building a great business. Some will be social causes. Some will be doing yoga and hatha yoga or mystical. There's no right or wrong to what that is because there's a complete spectrum of values for people. It's all spiritual. As Guru Nanak beautifully said, where's God now? Yes. Well, I love <laughs> Where that. There's nothing not spiritual as far as I'm concerned. If we don't see it spiritually, we somehow limited our mind and judged it with a very acute, narrow mind and didn't see the whole picture. And when we, when we judge something like that, we don't see the whole. And we miss out on a magnificent, inspirational state that's available to us at all times. Uh, we're not being forsaken, we forsake. Mm -hmm. We forsake uh, by judging it. So spirituality is, I always say, where is spirit not? It's all spirit. Yeah, I love that, I agree with that. Um, so one of the things that impacted me so much that you've already talked about in the breakthrough experience was the realization that any time I'm putting someone above myself, I spend a lot of years promoting other people and other people's work, and I will continue to do that because I love great teachers and speakers, but often I have myself in the pit, so owning my own voice or power, truth, or work uh, was a challenge because I was always like, oh, this amazing you know, made me really good at my job as a promoter and creating well, strategic alliances. The, the key though is the key is to not put other people on pedestals and exactly. pedestals, put them in your heart. That's right. And be a colleague along the journey. Because if you help other people get what they want, you'll get what you want. And it's not an altruism, it's not a narcissism, it's a transcendism. Yeah. And you Ooh. realize that it's neither one of those are the answer. Altruism eventually uh, makes you say, you know, what's in it for me? And narcissism eventually says, what's in it for them? It teaches you the other side. So neither one of those are sustainable. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's sustainable is a perfect equanimity. Yeah. So uh, we learn that through our tribulations and trials and errors, or we can learn that through foresight. It's wiser to learn through foresight than it is to have to go through hindsight. Yeah, so it's powerful taking people, you know, there were also people that I thought I was better than and used to prop myself up. So that helped idea of keeping people in your heart, not above you, not below you. And I remember you sharing a powerful story to speak to financial possibility of a financial planner who wanted to work with really wealthy people. And so you have her go through these different magazines and kind I, of, I, oh, yeah. Yeah. I call it owning the traits of the greats. I, I, in the greats of experience, one of the exercises that I do is there's a method that I developed called the Demartini method. And it's a, it's a science that, if applied, guarantees a result. But what it does is it helps you identify the things you admire and despise, that you look up to or down to, uh, the things that you hear as a hero trait or a villain trait, or the saint or the sinner, or the virtue and the vice, and own it. Because you've got to own both sides. See, if I went to you and I said, you're always kind, you're never cruel, you're always nice, you're never mean, you're always positive, you're never negative, always giving, never taking, your bullshit meter would go off and go, not always. And if I said, you're always mean, never kind, you know, nice, you're always cruel, you're never kind, you're always taking, never giving, always negative, never positive, again, your bullshit meter would go off and go, no, that's not true. 
But if I say sometimes you're kind, sometimes you're cruel, sometimes you're positive, sometimes you're negative, sometimes you're this, sometimes you're that, you'd immediately go, yep, that's true. So we only have certainty and acknowledgement when we embrace both sides. And we don't need to get rid of one side to be love. And so I do is I help people take the most empowered people, the most extreme heroes and villains, and own the traits. I went through a dictionary one time, a big Oxford dictionary, biggest one I could find. Very thin paper, lots of pages. <laughs> and I went and I circled every behavioral trait that I could identify in human behavior. So kind, cruel, nice, mean, considered, and considered, honest, dishonest. And I went through every one and circled it. Then I thought of a person who's the most extreme example that I've met personally that reflected that trait very beautifully, positive or negatively. And I put their name out there. Then I went inside myself and looked carefully of where and when I displayed or demonstrated that specific trait, action, or inaction that they demonstrated or displayed until I could own it 100% quantitatively and qualitatively. And once I realized that, I realized that nothing was missing in me. Sometimes I'm kind, sometimes I'm cruel, sometimes I'm honest, sometimes I'm this. I had them all. And then I realized the traits that I thought were positive, I looked at the downsides. And the traits I thought were negative, I looked at the upsides. And I realized that there are all human behavioral traits that we need in different settings. And there's nothing to get rid of. And so many people are so, they're, they're, they're shocked by that because they think, no, I need to get rid of half of myself. And I need to be this one-sided person. No. In fact, it'll be futile. As the Buddha wisely says, the desire for that which is unobtainable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable is a source of human suffering. If you strive to get a one-sided magnet, you'll be striving for eternity and you'll end up having futility. So I say learn to love all parts of yourself. You can't love, you won't be able to love yourself unless you embrace all, all parts. And you won't be able to love the world unless you embrace all parts. Try to change the world and fix the world by making it wrong based on your judgment, will only lead to futility. Because there's somebody out there with an opposite set of values to you that thinks, thinks just the opposite of you. And you'll run into them and probably even marry them. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about, so, like, addictive behavior? Where is that useful in a setting? Yeah, because the positive negatives are elusive. Yeah. You can't really label a positive or negative, really, ultimately. It's an illusion. The things we think are terrible a day, a week, a month, a year, or five years later, we find out that that's terrific and and the thing we think is terrific a day, a week, a month, a year, five years later, you find that it's got some terribles in it. You buy a new house, you think, oh my God, I'm so happy. And then you have all the challenges. <laughs> and you get this new, uh, you get to this new challenge and you think, oh my God, it's terrible. And then you look at, oh, thank God that occurred. These are, these are, they're, they're lucid. The emotions are subjective biases that we project on the events that are actually neutral until we are aware of it. So I, I'm not, uh, I don't find it productive to, uh, to strive for that which is unobtainable and try to avoid that which is unavoidable. I'd rather embrace all parts of myself. I would too, but addictive behavior, addictive I want to behavior. hear your answer. Well, addictive behavior is a strategy. Okay. It, when, when you have an event in your life that you haven't seen the blessings to, you go into your amygdala instead of your executive center, and you look for immediate gratification to compensate. And consumerism and immediate gratification and impulsive and compulsive behaviors, the desire center of the amygdala is the addictive center. And it's basically a compensation for unfulfilled highest values. If you take a person and start to prioritize their life and show them that they can empower themselves according to their priorities and take the so-called wounds that they've perceived that they thought were interfering with them and it cracks, the, they, they were designed in their life to crack their fantasies. I said that last night, that all the setbacks or feedbacks, all the things you think are terrible are actually trying to get you to break your addictions to fantasies of their opposite because pairs of opposites are born together. And the second you embrace both sides and you pursue something that's truly meaningful, that's not fantasy, you re-empower yourself, you get in your executive center, which automatically has self-governance and overrules some of the impulses of the desire center of the amygdala. So we have the ability to prioritize our life. But in the meantime, until we can fill our day with things that are important, we will sometimes escape looking for a quick fix to compensate for the unfulfillment that we're having. And consumerism is like an addiction too. We can consume other people's brands instead of build our own brand. But people who are addicted, and when they start to build a brand and they see things on the way, not in the way, they calm down their addiction without ever labeling it as a mistake or making it wrong. It's just a strategy until they come up with a greater strategy. I like helping people see the new strategy. 
Mm, powerful. Awesome. So if people want to, I know you're going to be here in Dallas offering the breakthrough experience. A lot of people watching and that will watch the replay are in other parts of the world. So I'd love for you to just mention how they get more from you well, and uh, and also if they're local. If they can, if they can uh, survive this, uh, this discussion <laughs> that I've made, uh, if that's of meaning to them, they can go on drdmartini.com and they can browse the website and find themselves to the events and they can look around the world. Uh, the website is filled with uh, all kinds of media interviews. There's thousands of them. And um, there's also live events that I do all over the world. I'll be here in Dallas this week. I'll be in Miami next week. I'll be in Tokyo the following week. And I think I'm in, I don't even know where I'm in. I think I'll be in Los Angeles coming up and London and Ireland. And I, I constantly move around the world, so. I know, I still, that's so profound to me, that um, conversation about the world is my home and how every hotel room is just like a different place in your house. And that change of perception with this ability. I know there are lots of kids, you know, lots of people that were military, children or just, you know, for whatever reason, always wanting to travel. So I love them. I love that. Well, I, I tend to think that, that, you know, it's all perspective. It, it's never what happens to it, it's our perception. You know, I, I can uh, see the entire house. My, my house is earth. And so instead of walking to room to room, I fly. Instead of talking to somebody, I Skype. I love it. It's all perception. I love it. And uh, so I have a long distance, uh, uh, dynamic. My my children are sometimes in different countries, and we rendezvous. And I mean, my daughter's here. She was here last night. Um, my daughter will meet me in uh, Miami next week. And um, you know, my girlfriend is in Cape Town, South Africa, right now. We'll rendezvous either in Brazil or somewhere in London or maybe France or someplace. And we just have a global lifestyle. And uh, so I do a lot. I don't drive. I haven't driven in 29 years. Or cut. I haven't cooked since I was 24. Love that. Love hearing it's been, that. It's been 40 years since I've cooked. And um, I have no desire to cook. I'd rather hire people who are inspired to do the job. I, I learned something many years ago that if I don't fill my day with high priority actions, it fills up with low priority attractions. So I love researching, writing, traveling, and teaching. So that's all I do. Everything else has been delegated to specialists who love doing those things. So that way I'm being surrounded by people who do what they love. And there's an energy in that that I love. And I, I, I go around the world to where I want to go together. I love it. And what about value? You talked about last night that um, your wealth was in your, you love to study your knowledge and all that. And then you said once you started creating or allowing yourself to value that, then you were able to create that financially. So I work with a lot of healers, people that are bringing their brands online in the world. Um, as, as well as women, and that is the core thing, charging. They feel so guilty about charging. I remember you doing by donation lectures yeah. at one point, right? So I, 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 uh, I, I started out, I, I was doing a uh, little tutoring and I was making minimal amount of money. And then I started to, uh, I was a suit salesman for pennies, believe it or not. JC pennies? JC pennies oh. at one time. And you get two for one by turning it inside out in those days. <laughs> oh my God. And, uh, but I, I made very good money doing that and made more money than the manager. And so he changed the financial incentives. Mm -hmm. As a result of it, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to pay for school that way. So I went ahead and just started doing classes. And I started out doing love donations. And very shortly, it didn't take long before I realized that not anybody loved me that way. <laughs> and, uh, and so I then finally said minimum love donations, you know, this amount, five, ten dollars, twenty dollars. And still not too many people put money in there because the universe is waiting for me to value me. Oh, and so I value me. The that's world a big one. Me. And so I, what I did is I said minimum fee, 20 bucks. And I went from making $20 to about three, 350 to $400 a night. And I was 23 years old and I realized, wow, what a lesson. Until I valued me. And then what I did is every time I increased my value of myself and valued myself, the clients grew. Mm -hmm. And the world around me reflected it. So I realized that I, instead of waiting for the world to value you, have a, something, do something that is truly meaningful, that, that is valuable to the world, and value yourself and put a, a fair price on it and watch what happens. It's amazing what happens. I am, I've been blessed. I, I would not have become financially independent if I had not started to value myself. 
When the world, you, when you value you, the world begins to. When you invest in yourself, the world invests in you. And when you pay yourself first, so do other people pay you first. Mm-hmm. It's a reflection. So it's That's a great gift. Huge. The world gives you a great gift by giving you feedback about your magnificence. Mm, mm, mm. Honor your magnificence and so the world. Um, and I, on the side, I do want to know. So I invited three people into the movie The Secret, and there have been mixed reviews about that, about being a part of it. And and The Secret did a great job of opening the conversation of self development. On, but it left a lot for people. You know, they knew. Well, I can't just sit here and wish all day long. We got to take more action. So I'd love to know any of your feedback about. About that well, experience. Uh, Rhonda contacted me and said that she'd like to have me participate in that. And I was, what she described seemed pretty inspiring. And uh, we were up in Aspen, there were a bunch of us up in Aspen with the Transformational Leadership Council. Jack Canfield had helped organize that and a few others. And so they filmed, and they filmed for like, three and a half hours on many of the people. I think they filmed like 33 people in three days. They worked day and night. And then they also got, I got to film again in Melbourne, Australia. Bit. And, um, you know, so they, even though they filmed like seven hours of work, I think I was in there for about a minute. Um, <laughs> Some of the things that I said weren't really resonant with everything in every room. And originally it was a two hour primetime television special. Mm-hmm. And it, it got changed into a Vivitas DVD release mm-hmm. because uh, the Commonwealth Games bought out the time that they were going to release it in Australia. And uh, when I first saw the video, I was a little bit taken because it didn't match exactly what I envisioned from what she had said. But she realized when she actually went to the the DVD, she had to uh, lighten it up a bit, make it more mass appeal, and put more of the people in it, because originally there was only six people. Mm -hmm. And so when they did it, it changed it. And my first reaction is, well, it's left out a lot of things that I would love to have said. And then I realized that but it actually met the needs of the market at the time. Mm-hmm. And millions of people valued that all over the world. So I'm very grateful that Rhonda had a pulse on the mass uh, needs. Mm-hmm. And even though we weren't able to give out some of the most profound principles in there, we at least opened the door with. And many of the speakers and participants in the movie, I think, afterwards in follow-up, in speaking engagements, were able to give the secret behind the secret left out of the secret. Yeah. And and there was more action on it mm-hmm. and more prioritization on it in most people's contribution. But I'm grateful for the secret because I think it, it helped me reach people I would not have reached. I was already busy, busy speaking about 280 times a year, but that moved it over the 300 mark. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the secret. Rhonda did a, a contribution and uh, but I think it opened up the doorways for us to keep adding and keeping the conversation going with the details that we, that it's not easy to edit into an hour and hour and a half. No. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah. I mean, a massive, massive amount, I mean, seven hours of mine, and let alone 33 other people, I can't even imagine how much editing had to be involved. So to be able to get that down into something that was inspiring and get the capture of some of the essence of it, great. I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity, but I'm grateful also for the, the clarification that I was able to do in live presentations. Yeah, that's so powerful. So I remember Roy Smooth calling and saying, hey, there's this woman doing this movie. She's looking for amazing, but they have to be very successful people. Who do you know? And they were calling me because I knew Dennis Waitley. And then I was like, yeah, and Dr. D and Lisa Nichols. And we called you, you guys were on. And then they called you, I guess. But some people have been like, yeah, mixed, mixed reviews. I think overall, most people feel like they got to really break it down on the stage, like well, you said. But yeah, I, like I said, there was, you know, the, the I'll just do this. I mentioned this last week. Yeah. When I was uh, in elementary school, we were told that atoms were little balls, that you put stick pictures and you take red and blue balls and red balls and things and you make these little stick pictures. And you think an atom is a ball. Then you go to high school or college, pardon me, and you find out that it's got protons, electrons, and neutrons. It looks like a little solar system, the Bohr model. And then you go on to a professor and, and, and go into college, and you find out it's probability distributions in complex mathematical equations. And it's uh, a little different. It's more abstract, more mathematical. And then you go further and get your PhD and go into a professor. 
and you find out that these theories have little bits and pieces that aren't quite uh, absolute yet. Yeah. And so we had to teach the illusions until we're ready for truth. And I think that the secret had to teach some of the illusions until people were ready for the truth. And I think the accountabilities that emerged over time in the pursuit of their dreams te taught them to start with the basics and build from the basics and continue to go. Start with what you know and let what you know grow. This is the master of life. Awesome, awesome. Um, Dr. D, thank you so, so, so much for your time and your inspiration and your wealth of knowledge. It's been absolutely phenomenal. If you are here in Dallas, Dr. D is here in Dallas this weekend delivering the Breakthrough Experience. I can tell you it was incredibly meaningful to my journey 10 years ago, 2004, something like that. I guess that's more than 10 years. <laughs> Dang it, how time goes. Um, I'm going to just scroll. Amy, Dr. D did answer your question earlier. I don't see any questions here. I just see wonderful sharing. So we're going to sign off. Is there anything else you'd like to close with? Uh, whoever's listening, uh, thank you for listening. And just know that uh, no matter what you've done or not done, you're worthy of love. And that you are worthy of doing what it is that inspires you. So give yourself permission to do something extraordinary on planet Earth because the true you is extraordinary. And prioritize your life. If you fill your day with high priority actions every day, you'll build momentum and your confidence and self-worth will continue to grow and your achievements will be extraordinary. So the real you is extraordinary, so give yourself permission to be you. Yay! Amy says thank you, Dr. John. All right, thank you guys. Bye. Hey, it's Adora Crystal again. I hope you so enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you did, please share it with three friends right now. Please use the hashtag the rich queen movement because we are always giving away prizes to our tribe. And if you want to go deeper with us, be sure to go to the rich queen movement.com and take the free class that we're offering. It's going to help you unlock massive gifts inside of your own DNA until next time. So much love.